It is uh, my honor now to, uh, and pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Charles Strain is Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University, and he came down from Chicago just to speak with us tonight. He is the co-author with Elizabeth Collier of Global Migration, What is Happening, Why, and a Just Response. Um, and that was just published this year. And he's co-editor of Religious and Ethical Perspectives on Global Migration, uh, which was published in 2014. Um, Dr. Strain is also an expert on Buddhism. And uh, his book, The Prophet of the Bodhisattva, Daniel Berrigan, is it I pronounce it correctly? Okay. Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva sorry. Um, Daniel Berrigan, Thich Nhat Hanh and the Ethics of Peace and Justice was published in 2014, and it was a 2016 winner of the Frederick String Award for an outstanding work in Buddhist Christian studies. Um, Dr. Strain was born and raised in uh, Pittsburgh. He obtained his bachelor's uh, from Duquesne, in, and he majored in philosophy and history, two very good liberal arts subjects. Um, and uh, he earned his PhD in religion from the University of Chicago, where, among other people, he worked with Martin Marty. Um, and uh, he is a former associate vice president for academic affairs at DePaul. He's uh, married with two sons and two grandchildren. And it is a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Strain. Thank you very much, Professor Atlas, for inviting me. Can you all hear? Okay. I want to particularly commend the freshmen in the audience and their professors uh, for tackling this important subject of refugees, migrants, and immigrants. So I welcome everybody, but uh, uh, particularly um, uh, hope that uh, this will be useful to the, uh, the freshmen in, in the audience. Um, the book that uh, uh, the Professor Atlas mentioned was done in collaboration with Catholic Relief Services. Uh, I and a colleague worked for about a year with them. Uh, it showcases a lot of the work that they do and tries to put it in a, in a global context. Uh, I encourage you to go to crs.org and just meander through their website and I'm sure you'll be as deeply impressed as, as I am. So uh, we live in a world that's in motion faster and more than ever before. Products and services, ideas and technologies, money and food, more than any time else in human history, we are connected with other folks. Tonight we're gonna to talk about global migration. Global migration was a topic that I had to learn. I think, again, for the freshmen, the most important thing that you can do in your college education is get out of your bubble. We're all in bubbles of one sort or another. I got out of a bubble uh, when my son Aaron and his wife Kate uh, were working with a NGO along the border, the Arizona-Sonora border. Uh, and Aaron said, Dad, you gotta bring some students down here. So what followed was 14 years with eight student immersion trips and two faculty immersion trips to the border where we talked with migrants. We lived with people in the colonias working in the factories uh, along the border and that's where I got educated. Had to read a bunch of books too, that's important, but um, uh, it was really uh, meeting migrants along the border uh, beginning to grasp that the U.S.-Mexico border is the one place on the globe where third world and first world, the affluent and the not so affluent are smack dab connected with, uh, with one, one another. So I owe my son a great debt. I owe even more the people of Nogales, Sonora, and the migrants uh, looking for, uh, for work. Um, so I reflect on the, those experiences, and that's how I got out of my bubble. This method of see, judge, act was invented by uh, Catholics working with factory workers in, uh, in France after World War II. Uh, it was then picked up 
by uh, other Catholics in, in Latin America. Uh, it's a way of, of doing an informed process of ethical uh, deliberation. We begin with C. Uh, we're all, as we look at reality, we're all slanted by glasses that we have. I have been known to walk uh, around the house looking for my glasses when they've been on my face. Uh, so our ways of looking at reality like our glasses give us a certain perspective but they can also blur other perspectives so it's important to take them off and get the prescription uh, checked and that's in part I think what we need to do tonight in terms of talking about uh, about global uh, migration. So as we start just a couple of definitions. The UN High Commission for Refugees defines a refugee as a person who owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. That's a fancy way of saying refugees are people who have fled for their lives. Um, a asylum seeker is a person who's made it to a new country uh, where they too have been refugees, but they made it to a country and they formally applied for resettlement uh, in that uh, country. Internally displaced people are those who also have fled violence and persecution, but uh, they remain uh, within the country in which, they're, uh, in which they are uh, uh, citizens. Economic migrations can be people who are invited as guest workers. Uh, they are also uh, often in the, uh, the U.S. context unauthorized migrants who come here um, seeking work. Um, okay, just to give you some context of this world in, in motion, more people than ever before in human history have moved from one country to another. Uh, 251 million people have done that. 65.6 .6 million have fled their homes as refugees or asylum seekers. Actually, those are 2016 figures. The figures for 2017 will easily be 66 million people. The Rohingya people in uh, Myanmar, about a half a million of them just in the last four or five months have fled for their lives into neighboring uh, Bangladesh. Uh, so this is an unprecedented number of people uh, who have fled for their lives. And you see, again for 2016, how very small proportion of these people are actually, um, have actually been resettled. They're either in camps or in cities uh, looking for work, trying to survive, uh, needing aid in, a, in an unprecedented way. A greater number of people are refugees now than even at the end of uh, World War II. Um, we tend to think that we're doing our part here uh, to help uh, refugees across the world. Um, that's actually a misconception. 84% of the world's refugees are in poor uh, developing country. Only 9% are in the uh, countries uh, that uh, are the most wealthy. You see here, we've all seen these pictures of the boats coming across the Mediterranean to Italy or from Turkey uh, to, to Greece. Uh, the, the news media were all over this in the summers of 2014 and, and 2015. Uh, but as you see, that doesn't really tell us what really happened. Here are the top 10 countries uh, who have absorbed refugees 
from uh, uh, other parts of the world, and only Germany, which opened its uh, gates uh, due to Angela Merkel and her uh, courage, really, in face of opposition, to invite uh, uh, people who were uh, fleeing from the civil wars in Syria, from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, invited. Only they uh, are a country that can be considered can be considered as part of the affluent countries of the world. All the other ones, Turkey in particular, uh, Lebanon, uh, a million people in Lebanon, one out of every six persons in Lebanon right now is a refugee. Think of the U.S., what that would mean. It would mean 50 million people in the U.S. would be refugees if we wanted to um, uh, just uh, uh, make a comparison. So uh, these refugees are a burden to countries that have very little wherewithal to help uh, uh, to help others. Children make up more than half of uh, of refugee children uh, world worldwide. Uh, children have special needs, we can ask ourselves, what is necessary for uh, a child living with dignity? What is, is more important? Certainly nutrition, at a period when their brains are going through rapid development, lack of nutri nutrition can uh, have a, a deleterious effect for the child's whole life. But if you ask the, uh, as CRS has done, if you ask the refugee parents themselves what's most important, top on their list is education. Uh, less than half of children, refugees, are uh, out, of, uh, out of school. When it comes to teenagers and high school or secondary school, uh, only about one quarter of those refugee teenagers are uh, in school. Miriam is a refugee from Mosul in Iraq. When ISIS took it over so, some few years ago, uh, uh, she had to flee. Uh, she and her family are Christians uh, and Catholics, for that matter, uh, and they fled to uh, to Jordan. Um, uh, Miriam was out of school for a year, um, and here's how she views that. Her, I think her words speak for themselves. So it's not just critical that children be fed and uh, given doctor's care, but education is critical, Miriam says, if you want to have a life. Uh, so we keep in mind how few of the refugee children uh, are actually able to be in school. To be out of school for even a year is put somebody um, in, in a difficult situation, but uh, Miriam is, uh, is one of the, the lucky ones. One of the things that we learned about Catholic Relief Services um, is uh, that they represent a whole lot of new approaches to aid. Aid is no longer and should be no longer simply handing out food. Rather, it seeks to empower refugees to take control of their own lives, even while they're in somewhat dire circum circumstances. And CRS has developed some of the strategies that you see here. Most refugees are not in, uh, in the situation that they're in for just a few years. They, they can be in uh, for whole decades, right? Many refugees and internally displaced people spend a whole generation uh, in, uh, uh, in camps uh, or essentially in a situation where they're not able to find work. So uh, uh, invest in long-term projects. And one of the things, if you think of uh, those refugees who are in Turkey, Lebanon, and uh, Jordan that I, that I mentioned, uh, those refugees living in the cities 
of those countries can put burdens on the uh, uh, on the countries themselves, and they can put burdens on poor Jordanians and poor Lebanese because the laws of supply and demand. Rents go up because there's more people seeking scarce housing. Uh, there may be competition for jobs with refugees willing to take anything they can possibly uh, get. So how do you create a win-win situation where the refugees are supported and given control in their lives and the people in the host country are not, particularly the poorer people in those countries, are not undermined by the presence of the refugees competing for, uh, for scarce goods. One of the ways to do that is the good old market capitalist system, right? Debit cards. Uh, instead of handing out food from the back of a truck, if you give a refugee debit cards, they're able to shop, they're able to support local businesses, they're able to decide what it is that their family uh, can best eat, right? Or how to divide the necessities of rent and, and, and food. So I was, we were particularly in doing this book, particularly impressed with these strategies that, uh, that um, CRS uh, uh, develops. This has a, one of the forms of migration that will affect particularly the younger folks in the audience is the people who are being made refugees because of climate change. The International Order for Migration gives a middle range estimate of the number of people who will be refugees by the year 2050. Their estimate is 200 million. Um, you saw the kind of backlash that happened in Europe in the summers of 2014 and 2015 when a few million people were pressing at the gates. Can you imagine uh, what is going to happen uh, in uh, several decades uh, when many more people are on the move because they because of the spreading desertification in Africa, droughts in other parts of the world, freak weather events in many parts. How, mu how much longer are people in Houston going to be able to live in Houston is an interesting question. Um, so uh, the term refugees is in quotes because they're not technically refugees and there is no official UN a uh, group that is devoted to coming to the assistance of climate change refugees. So they are people on the move, but people who are not yet in any kind of international uh, concerted way uh, um, being their needs being addressed. Carlos Cano is a Guatemalan. In the 1980s, during the civil wars in Central America, his father took his family to Mexico where they lived and worked for 16 years to escape the violence of the Guatemalan Civil War. They came back uh, the, 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 after the peace accords, the governments promised them land where they could grow coffee, and Carlos came back and became a coffee farmer. However, in 2012, he had to migrate to Mexico looking for work again. But in this case, it wasn't civil war, it was a fungus. Because of climate change, the heat level in the mountains moved up the mountains. Coffee, my little knowledge of how you grow coffee is that it needs something cool. It doesn't grow down in the tropical, at least if it grows down below, it is susceptible to a fungus. And fungus had destroyed, in some cases, about 85% of, uh, of the crops, uh, the coffee crops. So, but he didn't stay in Mexico. He came back partly because of, a, largely because of a Catholic Relief Services uh, strategy. Uh, the strategy was to work with coffee farmers, one, to replant their fields, 
since they, you can't go up the mountain when somebody owns the plot above you, uh, to replant their coffee uh, plants with fungus resistant types, but also to diversify their cropping, uh, to grow other crops not uh, as susceptible to this, uh, to this fungus. So uh, again, CRS is an example of uh, aggressive and um, uh, very thoughtful ways of addressing serious issues, and they do this ac across the world. Unfortunately, there are billions of people who are in uh, Carlos's position that need strategies for how to uh, how to not have to migrate. Right? There is such a thing called the right not to have to migrate. Right? Uh, which, in Carlos's case, he was lucky uh, for the support that enabled him to come back home. So let's talk about closer to home, closer uh, to our, our home. Um, there are 11 million unauthorized migrants uh, it is not the case that, that this is a ongoing invasion. Um, it uh, has been stable. The numbers of unauthorized migrants has been stable since 2009 uh, with slight fluctuations, but uh, uh, not, not growing. Um, let's look at this in a little... Pop quiz for the freshman. Who said this? When did he or she say it? About which group? Somebody? Hands. Take a guess. Well, guess it, wasn't recent. it wasn't recent. Getting warm, okay? Someone else? I have to do what I have to do in class myself and What's your guess? Huh? No clue. No clue. Huh? No? Give us a hint. Give us a hint. It, it gave you the hint. It was long ago. Benjamin Franklin? Say who? Say. Benjamin Franklin? It was Benjamin Franklin, indeed. <laughs> you get the gold star. But we didn't give the follow-up question, what, namely, who was he talking about? Germans. He was talking about Germans. You see in his statement in this letter, you see uh, something that has become invariable stereotypes that get passed on from group to group to group. Namely, they don't learn our language. Two, they're invading. They'll overwhelm us, right? Three, they don't abide by our values, our democratic way of life. Those are refrains that follow us all the way up to uh, 2017. Only there's a fourth factor, too. What's the fourth part of Benjamin Franklin's stereotype that we have inherited? Hmm? The fourth. Anybody? Hmm? Loud. They're taking jobs. They're taking jobs. Well, actually, he didn't say that. You know, they're just taking over our democratic way of life, is what he said. The, uh, the, the other factor is racism. He goes on in the letter that this is from to say, the country should be for the whites and the reds, ignoring the fact that there are Africans uh, who were here long before his, his particular ancestors uh, came came to the these shores. Notice Germans are not white. He refers to them as swarthy. Uh, that is a pattern that carries out. There's a great history book for some of you freshmen to get in, particularly if you have Irish ancestors like me. It's called How the Irish Became White. Uh, Race is not a biological factor, it's a social construction. 
And Benjamin Franklin at the very beginning started a pattern in American life that says they're not like us. I mean, he didn't ask any Reds, quote unquote Reds, whether they thought the country should just be for whites and Reds or maybe just Reds. Uh, he said, we're just a few folks here, us Anglo-Saxons, and we got to protect us. Uh, that pattern repeats itself again and again in American life, sad to say. We call it nativism, uh, and it has percolated um, through, uh, throughout our history. Yes, a whole series, again, one of the points that was one of the students mentioned here, they steal our jobs, they come to the U.S. via our southern border, uh, these are all th topics that you've um, uh, that you've heard. Here's some clarifications: immigrants of all groups, legal, authorized or unauthorized, Guatemalans, Mexicans, Poles, Russians, you name the group, they are less likely than native-born. Americans to have um, committed a crime. Um, the numbers of unauthorized migrants declined. We already talked about that. Uh, we don't really talk about this, but since 2007, a majority of newly unauthorized migrants in the states are not never came through any southern border. They came to this country legally and they overstayed. That's they're called overstays, right? Their visa might have been to be a, a student at Marion for a year or two. Uh, the visa expired and they find a job in Indianapolis and they are unauthorized migrants. Um, uh, so why do we hear all this about the southern border? We talk about the huge, the, the border patrol numbers now are larger than the FBI, the DEA, the AFT, uh, and the U.S. Marshals combined. All those, you know, the FBI folks that... Um, so we have more people slated for the southern border, although a majority of the new unauthorized migrants are, they came here via O'Hare Airport, right? Um, so these are all some of the misconceptions. It's suggested that immigrants, both authorized and unauthorized, uh, if you're, author, if you're an authorized immigrant, you're eligible for certain public benefits and services. And so for the first decade or so, you may be a net taker rather than a giver, but as over the lifetime, immigrants provide more resources in terms of taxes uh, to the public well-being than they receive in public benefits. And they've act Various economists have actually calculated about how much uh, that is. Uh, there's a lot of data about how they uh, stimulate uh, jobs as well. So how do we think about this? The, usually we think about a migrant coming to the U.S. as someone that's out to pursue his own or her own self-interest. Wages are better here than they are in Central America or Poland or some other place. Um, uh, and that's how they, uh, that's why they come. That's sort of standard economic theory. Uh, I've never met a migrant, and I met dozens of them along the border, uh, who are unauthorized migrants who subscribed, who said anything like that first bullet. Instead, what I heard from migrants repeatedly was the second bullet. They're here to support their families. They have a strong 
sense of family loyalty and, uh, and an ethical commitment to the well-being of their families. If you come from a country where unemployment is high, uh, where more importantly there aren't available financial services if you want to build a house uh, or if you want to have a mortgage or if you want to uh, uh, purchase a truck so that you can haul your corn to market. Um, instead of paying some middleman for that. Uh, when you don't have that banking system and that source of credit, someone in the U.S. can be that. I, I, my rule of thumb when I was li living with the people I met in the colonias, the, uh, the various villages around the, uh, uh, the Mexico-Arizona Border was that you could make it working in a Mexican factory, which was a good job, if you had three adults in the family. If you didn't have three adults, your only solution was to have one member of the family working in the U.S. These are family strategies that people, uh, people follow. There are also, I mean, the part of the problem of one and two is that you can say, well, that's their problem. I don't have anything uh, to do with that. Um, uh, economists have suggested that advanced industrial societies have a two-tier labor system. They have an upper tier in which you can get a job with a salary, with benefits, with health insurance and other kinds of, uh, of good things. And then you have a lower tier where there's no possibility for advancement, where there are no benefits, uh, and where, as, it's, as the phrase goes, where work is dirty, dull, and dangerous. Um, those second tier jobs are more and more filled by unauthorized migrants uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, U.S. 26 percent of agricultural workers are unauthorized migrants. 15% um, of people working in construction building downtown Indianapolis are unauthorized migrants. Doing the work that is dirty, dull, and dangerous, right? Um, uh, if you want strawberries that are really fresh, uh, you can get them, but you are almost invariably eating food that has been picked uh, by uh, unauthorized migrants. We benefit. I like fresh apples from Michigan or from um, uh, Washington State. Um, I enjoy the fresh apples and I like to get them without having to spend a whole paycheck for them. Uh, I benefit from the labor of unauthorized merchants. That changes the moral equation. It's not just them who have decided to come breaking some law of ours. It is us who are connected and work with folks. There we at one point uh, during World War II and following it, we had a program called the Bracero Program in which uh, migrants were hired, they came, they worked, but they were ruthlessly exploited, so much so that in 1965 this program was canceled. Uh, and um, from then till now, uh, growers in the Southwest have depended upon unauthorized uh, migrants to um, get their crops. Georgia uh, went on a vendetta a few years ago against uh, unauthorized people living in the state of, of Georgia as a result of which about a third of the, uh, um, the agricultural crops weren't able to be harvested and they got prisoners from the jails to come and, and do some of the uh, do some of, of the picking. So uh, the other point here is globalization has created dislocations. My example of that is something us Midwesterners are... The case of corn. Corn, we're familiar with, aren't we? 
Our senators uh, support it. Um, in, according to NAFTA, gradually the Mexican uh, government would reduce tariffs on corn. Corn has been grown in Mexico for 9,000 years. It is the staple crop of that entire uh, society. Uh, but according to NAFTA, tariffs that protected largely subsistence farmers uh, had to be done away with. Uh, the folks that ran the government in Mexico thought that was a great idea. Our guys will just go over and pick tomatoes, right? Um, and uh, so they let the tariffs go earlier than they had agreed to under NAFTA, and a highly uh, high-tech agriculture, corn-producing Midwest uh, was able to flood the Mexican market with U.S. corn. Not just did they flood the, the market because they had that technological advantage, but in 2003, for example, they sold corn for $1.76 a bushel when it cost the farmers to produce corn $2.66 per bushel. Now I kind of asked the freshmen here, since we come from Illinois and Indiana corn states, how could a farmer sell corn for $1.76 uh, when it cost her $2.66 to produce it without going bankrupt? <coughs> How? Government subsidies, yes. So the Mexicans were competing not just against the, um, against the high-tech agriculture industry of the Midwest, they were also competing against the American taxpayer. Um, as a result, approximately one and one-half to two million subsistence Mexican farmers um, went out of business. And where do you think they went? Um, Mexico City, perhaps. Uh, Merida, other big Mexican cities. But some of them, I'm sure, uh, given patterns that have been long established, ended up in working in, in Chicago. So, um, all of this says that we live in an interconnected world in which we have some moral responsibility. The Mexican farmer from Chiapas who came uh, to Chicago uh, is in part um, a product of the government that I uh, voted for that made these tr treaties that um, uh, led to dislocations. One of the sort of the silver lining to this though is that um, it doesn't last forever. In fact more Mexican Mexicans are returning to Mexico than are coming from Mexico these days just given shifts in demographics and in their um, the overall uh, e economy. So, I think we do need to talk about the wall, right? Um, and why the wall, right? The George Bush uh, tried to create a virtual wall, electronic wall, wall, but they could never get it to distinguish between an unauthorized migrant and a herd of deer. Uh, they spent a billion dollars on a virtual fence and finally it had to be canceled because it, it never worked. We do know what happens with walls. We've had 25 years of walls. There's 650 to 700 miles of walls along the southern border and we know what the walls did. One clue that they, what they don't do is they didn't deter migration. Precisely during the period from the middle 90s to about 2008, when the walls were in place, were the periods of a surge from
from something like 6 million to 12 million in 2008 unauthorized migrants in the, uh, in, in the states. So what did Walls do? What were their impacts? Well, the first impact was to kill people. What the walls did was force migrants out into the desert, into extreme terrains uh, where in, in the blister, I've been in Tucson in, in the summer in 106 degrees, but you get out into the desert, it's routinely 116 degrees in the, uh, in, in the desert. Um, about 7,000 people uh, lost their lives. Oh, that's of the bodies that could be found. Among which was this young woman whose crime was wanting to rejoin with her mother living in uh, uh, L.A. She had come all the way from El Salvador uh, but lost her life in the Arizona desert. So what else can we say about walls? The process of migration became expensive and dangerous. It meant that you couldn't just try to do it on your own. You needed a coyote, a, a guide, to bring you across. And because the price went up because of the danger of the trip, uh, guess what? The drug cartels horned in to uh, the, um, the ma and pop guides that used to run people uh, when the trip wasn't uh, as dangerous. So the drug cartels took over issues of uh, human uh, trafficking as well as, uh, uh, as uh, drug tra trafficking. It meant that the pattern that had been in place really since um, uh, uh, World War II of circular migration where mostly young men would come work seasonally in the US and then go home. If you're spending three or four thousand dollars to a guide to take you through the desert, you're not gonna go back next September if you came in March. You're gonna stay. The period when the walls were built is the period also when there's a surge in the percent of people of unauthorized migrants who have been in the states for more than 10 years is now 66 percent. It's too expensive to go back and forth. Even if a parent dies, you can't go back um, simply because you can't afford it. So it led to, in, instead of a circular pattern coming, working for a while, going back, coming and back, uh, it led to people permanently settled and led to families migrating together or in the case of Yasolin, uh, it led to her mother trying to um, support her children coming to, L to LA. Um, so as I said, the one thing that it didn't do was to deter mig migration. So let's look at, uh, let's talk about uh, ju uh, judging this uh, a bit. Uh, judgment is when you put out your values uh, and your ethical positions and you try to come up with an answer of what is just in this situation that we've been describing. Okay, so the first thing I think we need to do is think through our everyday language, right? We talk about illegal aliens, a term I'll never use. Aliens always strikes me as Sigourney Weaver, right? That's, uh, that's what comes to mind. It seems to be a fairly dehumanizing, even though there's a technical legal meaning to it. Um, uh, amnesty is uh, illegal is also, keep in mind that it is not a crime to be in the country without authorization. It is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. Kind of hard to describe the difference there. Uh, but so a majority of the, new, of the new unauthorized migrants have been here without ever committing a crime. They came in legally through a port of entry to come 
not through a port of entry is a misdemeanor. It's in the same category of crimes as defacing a dollar bill. Uh, the same level of seriousness in terms of its classification. Uh, amnesty implies we forgive you. Meaning we are, are, are the innocent ones, you are the one who committed the crime or did something wrong, but out of the goodness of our heart, we will um, forgive you. Um, that implies that we, or I in this case, are not complicit in the place of, uh, of unauthorized migrant workers in our society. I eat the apple just like Eve and Adam, right? The fresh apple produced by um, somebody from um, in Washington State picked by uh, an unauthorized migrant. So amnesty implies some sense of moral superiority of us, our senators and our, our, our own selves to the unauthorized person that tends to cover up our own complicity. Um, so from a ethicist point of view, that's unjust. Um, so amnesty is not a key term. Look at this. Here's something that draws on the biblical reference, Matthew uh, 25, uh, where Disciples ask Jesus, who is sorting out the sheep and the goats, um, when did we not um, feed you? When did we not visit you in prison? When did we not give you something to drink? That's what the, the terms on which a person is to be judged. Um, so it links that with the desert sun, but notice here the, the peasant on a cross um, uh, U.S. border policy is not just um, uh, what's key here I think in this in this placard is it's not blaming somebody it's not Mr. Trump or Mr. Obama it is U.S. economic policy in which we all have some voice some we, we vote we have some role in the whole shaping of uh, of this policy. Uh, it is what ethicists call the, the U.S. border policy that leads to death. Uh, it is a form of what we call structural violence. Violence not of one person shooting another person, but of a government setting up policies that are bound to um, uh, unjustly hurt other human beings. Um, uh, I find this interesting that it didn't come from any any religious organization, but from uh, the uh, Tucson Daily Star, right? So, again, the Bible calls us to remember, right? Remember that we all came from somewhere. Our ancestors came here. Even Native Americans came here across a land bridge into into uh, what is now uh, Alaska. We all came from somewhere. Remember is what uh, the, the Bible says. Here's uh, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops talks about uh, another, these unauthorized um, migrants. Many of them would love to be circular migrants to work March through September in the agricultural fields and go back and build their homes and uh, start their businesses in, in, in Central America or Mexico, um, restore due process rights. Uh, a lot of this um, is technical. I can um, go into some of it um, uh, at the, in the, in the Q&A if, if you wish. Come back. Certainly possible um, for 
us to do all sorts of things, some fair trade items for sale outside tonight, I heard. Um, that's one way. Uh, support NGOs um, like Catholic Relief Services. Support sane immigration reform legislation. It doesn't have to be this way. We could have a guest worker program that didn't uh, exploit people uh, and still have fresh apples, maybe that would cost a bit more so that people could be paid a, a more fair wage. Um, there's a Buddhist principle here, do not avoid contact with human suffering. We do live in our bubbles. We tend to forget what some people uh, go through just to stay alive or to keep their families alive. One of getting out of my bubble was going to the U.S.-Mexican border and seeing the suffering there of people struggling to make it in Mexico or struggling to make it by sending one of their family members to the States. Um, So those all have to do with ac action. I'm just going to end here with the bookends uh, talking about uh, a man by the name of Daniel Pasquini Salazar who's with Hussein, a goat herder on the West Bank uh, in um, under occupied... Um, well, in any case... I point to Daniel because he did something very smart with his college education, which I particularly want to commend to the freshmen. Um, he built what I call a ladder of engagement. He involved himself with a whole series of steps and actions, and here's, here's what he did. He went on a study abroad trip, uh, spend a semester abroad uh, in Argentina, I believe. Um, he found a, uh, a, a non-profit organization that he worked for there. He polished his Spanish-speaking skills, which led him to graduate and become uh, a, a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, which he did for uh, two years. Uh, and then he came back from there, came to my university, DePaul University, took a master's degree in uh, international public uh, service, and then he became an international fellow working with the Catholic Relief Services. He went from there to working with Oxfam in Iraq. When I caught up with him last, he was in South Sudan uh, working again with Oxfam. In each case, he developed his strengths and his abilities by building this series of deeper and deeper involvements. Catholic Relief Services has such a ladder. Their college ambassadors are, are one. They have domestic interns, people who work in Baltimore in the summers. Then if, like Daniel, you go and get yourself a, a graduate degree on some aspect of international uh, development work, then you can apply to become an international fellow. So the idea of college is to progressively build up your powers so that you can do things that are good and just, and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.